So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, Jerem Mitchell is my name. I'm the Group HR Director at Permanent TSB. And um, just give you maybe 30 seconds about myself. So, um, and it's innovative in its own right, I guess. So, Permanent TSB are a 202 year old organisation. And miraculously, we're still regarded as Ireland's number one challenger bank after all those years. Um, <laughs> and, and in that 202 year history, um, uh, three years ago was the first time that the bank decided to appoint a non HR um, person to the role of HR director, which was quite unusual in its own right. So my own path is, is um, I, I guess, very much on the customer side, very much on the commercial side, starting in branch banking, uh, working my way through to regional sales directorship, um, then going into the executive team and working from there in terms of rebuilding out of the, the Troika issue, because if anyone wants to ever put their mind back to that time back to 2012 through to 15, and then a big, lovely remediation program that I can't use bad language to describe, and then in May 2017 into HR. So um, it's quite, a, quite a, I guess, an unusual path for somebody to get into HR, but I have a deep passion for innovation, and I had the pleasure of studying under Peter uh, many years ago when I did a, a master's in strategic HR and innovation. So um, it's a passion that has existed long within me, and. Um, this afternoon, I'm going to try and cobble together um, a couple of bits and pieces that touch on the commercial world, but also, in so far as I can, try and touch on the role of HR in terms of its ability and its role to move away from the tactical personnel management that we've all grown accustomed to through payroll and benefits and what have you, to actually becoming a true strate strategic enabler and focusing in particular on two areas, leadership and the profound influence of leadership on culture to open up the organisation to the idea of, of innovation, to create a safe, a psychologically safe environment for people to share ideas and to bring forward stuff. So um, unlike most HR functions, I'm starting on the outside as opposed to focusing on the internal problems that we have. So we're going to have a quick look at the, today's workplace, the case for innovation itself, what might need to be done within the organisation, a kind of a for example as to what we've done ourselves in the last couple of years, and then I might finish with the importance of alignment <coughs> in terms of bringing strategy, culture and talent together as uh, kind of like that holy trinity of, of, um, of, of focus points that we really need to kind of have front and centre uh, on this journey. So um, this is a busy <coughs> slide, and I hate when people say that because nobody can read it, um, but there's probably three points I would pull out in it. One is the fact that um, this is kind of a fact base or a quick <coughs> snapshot of the world of work because without engaging the people in our workplace, the chances of innovation are going to wither on the vine. And there's kind of three main pieces. Optimization and technology includes, we say, digital disruption and automation, robotics, and all that goes with it. And within that domain here, about two-thirds of executives worldwide believe that a quarter of the workforce needs to be retrained retra by 2023. So in terms of actually embracing and engaging that talent pool and bringing it to life in the way that it should be is a huge ask. In terms of capability uplift, 72% of organisations believe that they haven't got the right talent, and 20% of those said same organisations are underutilising the talent that they have. So there is a huge pool of latent resource and ability that has been completely and utterly untapped, whether they've been forgotten about or whether they're, they're, they're deemed to be old school and they're not ready to be trained or they don't have the ability, they are being forgotten about and it's a huge wasted resource. And then on the, on the, the colleague experience side, so we, we all know that we consume product and services today at 2019 levels, but in work it's like 1979. <coughs> so like from a colleague experience point of view, we really have to do more to bring life into the organisation such that it, it, it reflects the world in which we live. And 87% of organisations that have high levels of engagement outperform the market time out of number. And individually, people, this, this, this 3.4x, people are 3.4 times more productive in highly engaged organisations. So again, the role of culture and leadership in, in nurturing that level of engagement and unleashing the energy of the, of the people in the organisation is hugely important in innovation terms. So then, if we take the workplace and then we look at the the world, and again, I'm, I'm conscious that a lot of people will, will use some of these slides, but if you take Alibaba, the world's most um, valuable retailer, if you take, and but it has no inventory, if you take Airbnb, the world's biggest provider of accommodation, but yet it doesn't have any real estate, and if you take the likes of Netflix, the biggest producer of movies in the world, but yes, it has no cinemas or it has no real estate either. The world of the business model that we have <coughs> kind of grown up with and lived with 
up to the last kind of 10 years has been completely and utterly thrown on its head. I won't touch on the other three because of time, but I guess they, that the point has landed hopefully with those three. And then workplace, digital disruption, and then what does that mean for financial services? So this slide here attempts to try and just kind of paint a picture to try and say, well, look at what's happening in the, in the ecosystem and in the environment. And very simply, you can see that our lunch has been eaten, <coughs> and the dinner and the main course as well, by the way, um, over here by kind of what we'd call neobanks. Um, now, a lot of these players are in the area of personal financial planning. A lot of them are in the area of payments um, and that kind of stuff, where self-direction and the role of self-direction actually is quite interesting in cultural terms, in terms of what does that do in rebuilding trust with society and rebuilding trust with customers after the last 10 years. And if you think about trust in banking, like it, the word trust itself is, is deeply imbued in the, in the language of banking because it's derived from the word credit, which is the Latin for credere, to trust in. So what's the role of digital disruption in rebuilding trust with customers and with society? And here we have these organizations sitting outside of the regulatory um, per perimeter, effectively providing services, but yet they're un completely unregulated. So where do we sit from uh, an arbitrage perspective there? So again, these are challenges that are, that, that are effectively damaging the business model, but also creating the unmet needs and the unrealized needs uh, of, of customers. And then we kind of we pull around <coughs> and to, to the earlier point in terms of when customers and when yourselves go on Amazon or you go on Google or you go on Twitter or whatever, and then you flick into your banking app, you expect the same level of seamless experience. Um, and yet every bank in the world has been broke for the last 10 years. And for the 10 years prior to that, there was such an amount of business being uh, written and commercial development happening that effectively investing in infrastructure didn't happen. So essentially, you're looking at a 20-year cycle whereby the right level of investment has not happened, bar just keeping the show on the road. And for some organizations, unfortunately, you know, the wheels came off the, the wagon once or twice. But for the most part, there's a huge amount to be done here now. So that's kind of where we're at. And we're all at different stages. I've, I've put up um, the, just the retail banking, um, uh, I guess the, the banks represented in Ireland from a customer point of view. And all of us are at different stages in terms of how we evolve our business model and how we build a proposition that meets with the Ireland of today. And then in permanent TSB terms then, so we, we kind of bring it down from the sector then, and we look to see how have we actually looked at this. And so in terms of our innovation portfolio mix, we're starting at the bottom and we're working our way up. So the most important thing, <coughs> is, to, the most important thing is to keep the lights on. So our two core systems in terms of stabilize and maintain, that bedrock has to be, it, it really has to be so resilient. <coughs> Otherwise, we don't get the right to actually go into the area of developing opportunities that are adjacent to our existing business model. And we certainly never earn the right to get to the top here, which is really about disrupting and bringing disruption um, to the marketplace in the way that we would like it to be. Now, financial services is different to so many other consumer products in the sense that the complexity of financial products in terms of um, opaque terms and conditions, vague performance attributes and what have you means that financial services are probably the only area where you buy a product without knowing how the product is going to perform over 30 or 40 years. So how do you actually stay relevant and how do you actually manage that product through a life cycle <coughs> for a customer whose life is also changing from the point of starting a job to starting a family <coughs> to working through middle life to retirement at 65? So again, the challenge within financial services in innovation terms is hugely challenging. And from a regulatory point of view, it is arguable that innovation will, will effectively start to come back, such as the complexity of financial services products. And the role of regulation in, in stemming innovation is a, is a huge challenge for us right now. Okay? And I'll show you some examples with that in a second. So managing this information portfolio is, is, is an ongoing cycle, and in actual fact, it's one of the core skill sets we're trying to develop within the organization. And I'll give you a flavor of that in the next slide. So what we're trying to do here is, is that we're trying to say, well, look at, we established three years ago our FIS team. It's FIS with an S, so it's FinTech Innovation Strategy. And we established a team, and we domiciled them away from the rest of the organization. We did, did so on purpose, and they wanted to go there as well, such that they weren't pulled into the day-to-day -day of, Jesus, tonight, here we go again. They were in an entirely different space. They had an opportunity. Nobody wore a tie. They all wore runners. And they, they got to, to look at things in a slightly different way. And in, in many respects, we, we, we positioned them within an ecosystem where there were other startups 
and other fintechs and what have you, such that they could feed off each other. Now, we kept ties very close with the bank in terms of kind of the core systems to try and say, look at, can we actually build as we go here? And then every so often, they would take a list of stuff and we would put together an innovation opportunity team. And this team would, broadly speaking, be blended a blended team whereby you have three people from the, the FinTech Innovation Center and three people, we'll say, from our core banking and our core business model. And we would start to work these teams together. And I'm going to ruin Peter's PhD program. Really, all that can happen here is one of three things. One is the bloody thing works and is put back into the system. There's a new piece of value identified outside of the business model, and we go ahead and we develop that, or we just kill it quickly and peacefully. But it's really that mindset of ideating, designing, um, modeling it in some way, getting to a minimum viable product, refining it again, and then keep going around and around <coughs> and around we go. And so it's constant iteration over time. So it's the release of incremental value as opposed to one big massive silver bullet that's going to change the, the, the future of the organization. That's broadly speaking how, we're, how we started to push together and what's working today. And then I, I have a fidget spinner as well. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the symbols don't mean anything really, it's just kind of colorful. Um, and, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this. In particular, I want to spend a little bit of time where you're sitting on the top left-hand corner, and in particular, the area of culture and leadership. And I'm going to start with leadership because of the profound influence on culture that leadership has. Leadership behavior, the accountability of leaders, the respect that leaders have for people in the organization, and actually thinking about what we mean by leadership. What is leadership? It's not management, but it, it's, a, it's a significant position of power, and people look up to leaders to say, well, look, at how are you going to help us do this? You have the power. But power in physics is defined as the release of energy. It's not about force. It's not about kicking stuff <coughs> through. It's not about delivering something for my ego or for somebody else's. It's about releasing the energies of the people within the organization to go and create and take care of customers and look after each other and to deliver for both customers and society in a way that they may not have done before. And within that, the sh it shapes the culture in terms of, number one, having a shared vision that's supported by values that actually connect and are meaningful to people in the organization. It creates a psychologically safe and open environment where ideas and conversations are encouraged and people get a chance to kind of share what it is on their mind. And this concept of speaking freely, you know, we've moved away from whistleblowing entirely because of all the connotations and associated with whistleblowing, but speak freely. Say what's on your mind, talk to us about our customer, talk to us about what's happening in the organization and having leaders that are not defensive in terms of embracing that. The impact of all of that then in terms of performance management, I'll show you in a second, because performance management really has been very individually focused in terms of what you've done and how you've done it. Whereas now we're moving into a model whereby it's all team-based. And how we're putting our teams together, this is Project Forte, or Program Forte, we mentioned it at the start of this year. Um, so we're putting 70 million behind this program that focuses on three pillars. One is the customer journey, number one. Number two, the core platforms, and then building an API layer to take advantage of open banking through PSD2, and then ways of working. How do we actually work more collaboratively and in a much more integrated way? And where do we go with that? I couldn't resist putting in a light bulb because I knew it would upset Peter. And we have our FinTech Innovation Center <coughs> over there. We have another um, symbol for it, but I thought that one was appropriate. So where we go from there then, this allows us then to build a team. So unlike previous hierarchical teams, yes, we have a business owner, but now we have all of these self-organizing teams where you have peer-to-peer -peer accountability. You have daily stand-ups. You don't have project managers. You have agile coaches. You know, you don't, have you don't have team leads, you now have scrum masters. So the whole, you bring the whole piece of agile to life and you develop proof of concept that way and the whole piece with regard to iteration of all of the, the, the models here with regards to how we actually bring that through life is going to provide a huge challenge in terms of performance management because it's no longer about the individual, it's about the interdependency across teams of people networked right throughout the business and in actual fact beyond the business in partnerships in the commercial world. So what has this led to? Uh, the so what question, what have you developed? Well, very little so far, but we've huge hopes. <laughs> <laughs> we've huge hopes for the future. So well, the, I guess the, the last biggest thing that we've brought to, to life has been in the last kind of year, which is um, an online uh, lending platform, which is um, we can issue a term loan end to end in 15 minutes. No customer interaction, no signatures, nothing. 
and nobody else is able to do that right now. So that has been innovative in its own right. From a HR point of view, we've partnered with the likes of Higher Up Online to try and get uh, employee referrals through, and that would have been different to the standard model. But what we did previously, if you think about the financial crisis, in 2008 we had 6 billion of deposits, and four years later we had 12 billion at a time when 40 billion left the state. And one of the key enablers of that was the development of a product called an interest-first deposit account, whereby, you know, <coughs> you got your interest within a week of opening the account. You didn't have to wait two or three years to get it. And it was a massive game changer, and nobody has been able to copy it since. In 2014, when we re-entered the lending <coughs> market, we developed a home mover product which said to people, we're happy for you to hold on to your tracker and move it to a new property because your family has grown and you haven't got space where you're at. Nobody else was able to follow that for a number of years. So that's the kind of innovation we're trying to bring to life. Within our business model, we've moved from a branch manager model, whereby we have one in each town, to a territory management model. Such is the connectivity with people nowadays. We can't have a situation whereby the guy in Tullamore is doing something different to the guy in Athlone who's doing something different to the person in Mullingar, because they're all 30-minute commutes. So we're moving to a territory model within that old 202-year-old branch banking model. So there are kind of areas in which we're trying to innovate, both at a business level, a product level, and also within our structure. And then finally, I started with talking about kind of the importance of alignment. This is the holy trinity uh, for, for myself and for our own team. Have the right strategy, um, the focus on the culture, that open culture, that respectful culture, that culture whereby piracy is killed and builders are rewarded for their their, their dedication and their resilience and iterating, that compassion is shown for those that actually have a failure and they get a chance to go again. But most importantly, it's really about you know, releasing the energies of the talent within the organisation, thousands of whom in all of our respective <coughs> organisations have really not been tapped or opened up to the possibility of the future in the way that it could be. So I'm not sure whether that covers a uh, huge amount about innovation. It touches a little bit on HR and on the broader environment, and I'm quite happy to take any questions at any stage. So thank you very much. Sure.